Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And this is going to be my top 10 games of 2022. These are going to be the top 10 of 2022. Over on Patreon, I will have 11 through 20 if you want to check those out. I'll have a bunch of extra Patreon videos going up over the next month or so, just covering a variety of overflow, as it were, from a bunch of these 2022 lists. But with that said, and before we dive into it, this particular video is sponsored by WSBG, the World Series of Board Gaming, who they had past year, they had the World Series of Board Gaming. They gave away $40,000, over $40,000 worth of prizes and that's going to continue in 2023 as well. It's going to be again, be a September, I believe, late September 2023 at Valleys in Las Vegas. They're gonna be running the World Series of Board Gaming, 16 different games. You can enter to win a variety of different options. They have a bunch of packages, packages that'll give you room and board and all that in addition to four entries, a bunch of things to look at. I do recommend some of the higher price packages. They are more expensive, but they do cover your actual stay at the same time, which almost pays for itself off the bat over there. I had a great time in it last year. I really like, I put that out before I ever got sponsored with them in any way but do understand they are sponsoring this particular segment and by the way if you use my code that i'll link to down below you'll also save 40 dollars off some of those higher price packages so you can check that out if you'd like i'll be there again because i had a great time but with that said let's go ahead and dive into the top 10 games of 2022 starting off we're going to be going through these from the top moving our way downwards yes i timestamp everything so feel free to ruin all the excitement and energy and fun times by just looking at the timestamps you can do that go ahead i understand but with, before we do let's start with number 10 which has actually been on camera this entire time, The Foundations of Rome. Foundations of Rome is my number 10 pick for my 10th favorite game of 2022. This game from Arcane Wonders is a polyomino behemoth of a game that is not cheap, it is, it is expensive, it, is, it costs a lot, it is all those things, but it is amazing in terms of both the gameplay and the production. This over here is the Sun Drop Gigantic Box, is the name for it, I can't remember what the name is, but all of this over here, you can have giant polyomino miniatures, structures, just minis. It's a lighter game, it's not that light, but it's a little on the lighter side. It's a polyomino area control game as you vie for spots on the board, as you try to pay into different lots, and as you use those lots to put the buildings out that you need. Combine that with the place in the buildings as you upgrade, combine that with the variable point scoring of how buildings score, and the game is simple in what it actually does, but it's actually very complex in the strategy and the level of screwage and tactical placement that exists in this game. Combine that with the table placement, which is excellent. Combine with the fact that it takes five minutes to set up and five minutes to tear down. Despite the huge box and the amount of miniatures, this is a very accessible game to go ahead and get playing. It's a great game. Foundations of Rome is my number 10 pick of 2022. Expensive, but also very, very good. My number, I guess we're up to nine over here. My number nine pick of 2022 is going to be Lacrimosa from Devere Games. Lacrimosa is a mid-weight Euro, heavy, little, let's call it medium-weight Euro over here from Devere Games in which you are playing out the life of Mozart. I believe Mozart. I think so. Mozart. Yes, Mozart. I, I don't actually remember because I'm less involved in the theme and more involved in the gameplay. The core game mechanic ultimately has, across several rounds, you're going to have a hand of 10 cards or 9 cards, I believe. You're going to be placing those 9 cards, choosing 2 each round to slot in for a top and bottom action, similar to Gloomhaven, although just a tad different than Gloomhaven. The game is meaty, it is crunchy, it gives you a lot of rewarding things that are going on within the engine itself as far as trying to figure out how to optimize combining your movement around the map and your placement to different, like, you know, the, re the, the scoring regions at the bottom of the board you're going to be going for, combined with upgrading your cars, combined with commissioning works of arts, everything kind of plays off one another as you get very well benefits that will increase your engine in the game. Lacomosa is fantastic, I've really enjoyed playing through this one. This is my number nine of 2022. My number 8 of 2022 is, I want to say, the lightest title on this list, but light does not mean it's not good, because this one is absolutely amazing to dive into. From Uwe Rosenberg, we have Framework. Framework is part of a series of games, or I should say a spiritual successor, kind of. I don't know if it's an actual series, but it's obviously a series. We have uh, Nova Luna, Sagani, and Framework, all from the same designer and all from three different publishers. But Framework, to me, is my favorite of those three, even though they are mostly doing the same thing. The core concept of all these games is the idea that you're going to be taking tiles, and every tile both serves as a way of fulfilling scoring objectives on other tiles, while also giving you scoring objectives itself. A tile might give you a red frame, but also want to be next to a series of green and yellow frames. And the way you actually put your frames out means that as you put down that red frame, you might be fulfilling a different objective while setting yourself up for new objectives to be fulfilled. As your board builds, you're going to slowly be surely be putting out your objective tokens, and the person who clears their objective tokens first wins the game. 
framework to me. There are small nuanced reasons as to why I enjoy this one more than the other two in the series, although I enjoy all of them. But I would say the two main reasons I enjoy framework more is because, first of all, I think it is the simplest of the series without compromising in any way on the depth of gameplay. And then secondly is I enjoy the interlink interlinking frames. This one has one that the other ones don't in the sense that you can have a bunch of frames overlapping within the same tile, chaining into different ways, and the combination of that plus the simplest, the, the more simple of the three makes this one my favorite, although I do own all three. My number seven over here, and this is where we start. This is a list full of big boxes. I apologize in advance. It is what it is. My number seven is, I'm sorry for this. My number seven is Mosaic from Colossal Games. So that's not true, from Forbidden Games. I don't know why I said Colossal Games. Mosaic from Forbidden Games is my number seven on this list. This one is a big box game from Forbidden Games that is giving you a Civ light kind of experience. I actually call it Terraforming Mars Light in terms of what it does for me. This one to me is it's simple, it's accessible, it's easy to dive into, it has eight simple actions every single turn, those actions are all going to be going towards building up your tableau. In the game what you're doing is you're taking eight different actions, you're either building a pyramid, or you're possibly moving armies, or placing armies on the board, or you're gathering a new government, or you're gathering new technology, or you're building a city, or you are increasing your population, or you are taking taxes or tariffs, and I'm sure I'm missing one, but I can't remember exactly what it is, but you have eight different actions you can take, and all of them are improving your tableau in some way. All of them are enhancing the way you will engage with the game. Producing. Producing. That's one of the actions. One of the core actions is actually producing on the tableau that you are building across the course of the game. Every single action is quick. You take your turn, you move on. You take your turn, you move on. You go around and around, but you're constantly trying to figure out the optimization of how much do you build up your engine versus when do you start cashing in on that engine as much as possible to gather the stone, the ideas, the food you need to build up your civilization and be known throughout history as you accomplish a variety of scoring objectives and goals within the game, trying to figure out all the ways to leverage both the in-game area control, the civilization achievements, and all those things, and of course your cards themselves and the way they will score and play off one another in this game. It is very simple to actually learn and understand what's happening. The core puzzle of it is often figuring out which levers to adjust, where to start cashing in. It is a rewarding game that is simple to learn and, and very complicated to actually figure out how to optimize around. My number six. I think we're up to six, I can never really count. My number six is one that has been on a lot of top ten lists from a variety of people so far already, and I expect it to continue. It is Endless Winter from Fantasia Games. My number six game of 2022. This is it, the Endless Winter, which is a fantastic experience combining worker placing and deck building in a game that almost did it first in a weird way, but then came out after because of the nature of Lost Moons of Arnak and Dune Imperium, and this one coming out later, despite being on Kickstarter first, but actually hitting the general audience much later. This one is... A phenomenal experience with art by the Mitch Show and gameplay that is smooth and simple to engage with. It's a little bit messy as far as the actual, I just said smooth and simple, I know. It's a little bit messy as far as what the game seems like when you have all these different modules at play on the table, all these different factors. You have a little bit of a side puzzle of area control and the encampments. You're also trying to gather these animals that will work into your tableau. In the meantime, you're also building up your various cultural cards as well as your actual pure worker cards in the game. And all of those are different elements you have to kind of figure out where to push and where to place your worker, where to cash in on that first player bonus to get something and where it doesn't matter. Combine that with a ton of expansions so that no two games of this ever have to be remotely even the same, and Endless Winter gives you incredibly... Again, the gameplay, the smooth versus the complicated part, comes from the fact that the game does seem messy at first, but as soon as you start playing it, everything works together beautifully. Everything chains off nicely off each other, giving you all the same, feeding into the same tableau as you build up your monoliths, as you megaliths, as you build up your megaliths in the game, trying to get as many points as possible in Endless Winter. Solid experience, really enjoy this one. Haven't played the solo mode yet, and I do really want to, but we'll get to that eventually. My number five is one that is... One, a game that I thought I'd be getting rid of, but a game that has definitely managed to uh, move its way very quickly up the list, and that's going to be Zombicide, Undead, or Alive. When I first unbox this game, I have an unboxing for Zombicide, Undead, or Alive, an unboxing and rambling where I talk about different things, and I debated whether I should even unbox it, versus whether I should just get rid of the entire thing in Shrink and get as much, you know, of a return as possible by selling it new, brand new, all that stuff. But I was like, it's Zombicide, and I did play it during the campaign. I had a chance to play the TTS during the campaign when it was first on Kickstarter, and I remember enjoying it, but also, it's not Black Plague, and it's not Marvel Zombies, so there's no way on earth this stays in my collection, right? I don't need that much Zombicide. It's, I, can't, I can barely excuse what I have already, let alone getting more, and of course, come on, we'll have more Zombicide down the road, so why in the world am I getting my hands on this? 
And the answer is because this one's amazing. I've started playing this one and this is the hardest zombicide experience I've had to date, but not so hard where it feels crushingly like you're going to die at any moment, but rather it feels like you cannot afford to take chances. You have to play optimally. You have to pick your characters optimally. You have to choose exactly what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. This is not your beer and pretzel zombicide game. This is a zombicide game that is meant to punish you if you like that kind of thing in zombicide, and I personally do. Now, I did see someone at one point comment, because I mentioned, I've mentioned this a few times now, and I saw someone comment saying they feel the game is less accessible to newcomers and it's designed around hardcore zombicide players like myself and i hear that i do hear that if you are someone who's new to the zombicide system you may not want to pick up undead or alive unless you're prepared for the fact that it is much harder than a typical zombicide or unless you're willing to house rule around making it more easy to to actually dive into which those things are possible but it's worth knowing that as much as i enjoy that crunchiness as much as i enjoy how much work goes into actually trying to survive in zombicide in this particular version and iteration of zombicide you might not like that in Undead or Alive, you're playing as typical in Zombicide. You're playing as six different survivors trying to accomplish goals in specific scenarios, trying to take on the horde of various abominations you'll have to deal with, trying to take on the specific zombies that are going to be coming your way, throwing in whatever expansions or add-ons you manage to get, or your whole t the, the horde of heroes you have at your disposal. The game is absolutely a blast. I've enjoyed m many versions and iterations of Zombicide, but Undead or Alive is rising fast for just how much of a enjoyment I get out of the actual feeling of accomplishment I get when I win a scenario. My number four is one that I've been talking about for a long time. It's one of a few prototypes. There's only a, there's only a handful of prototypes that I've had in my collection where they don't go into my prototype pile. When I'm done with them, they go onto my game shelf because I want to actively play and enjoy you as much as possible until that final game arrives. And the final game has arrived, but this is one of those games. Mythic Mischief is a game from Ivy Games that I held onto. This went on my game shelf, went next to my abstracts. Not this, but the prototype version of this was available for me to constantly pull out and play because at no point that I can consider this a game that was gone, I always wanted to be able to table this one, proto prototype or not. Broken heads on the miniatures I got in my prototype or not, or I shouldn't say got so much as destroyed. It was a prototype with prototype level of quality, not final game, don't worry, your final game is safe, hopefully safe, should be safe, and honestly, the headless miniatures end up being their own faction anyway, sort of, not really. But Mythic Mischief is a, an abstract strategy game that is very thematic despite being an abstract strategy game. The game is also, was, the game has a bunch of various uh, cliques of students in school trying to evade the Tome Master, trying to, the Tome Keeper, trying to wander around the library as you try to sit there and figure out how to keep your students safe by moving walls, by using powers, by pushing and pulling various uh, elements in play, while the other team is trying to figure out how to capture you and stay safe, them stay safe themselves. The game lasts either across two rounds, the Tome Keeper moves across his destinations, or until a team has achieved 10 points. Either way, you're going to end with a bunch of people trying to desperately vie to stay one step ahead of your opponents in the game. It is a great engine of an experience, it is a great tactical abstract strategy game, it is my number 4 of 2022. My number three of 2022 is the biggest box on the table. Arguably, I think, I think it's bigger than this one. My number, and it's, it's just, the, just the lid over here because I can't take that chance. My number three of 2022 is Frosthaven. Frosthaven is my number three game of 2022 in terms of just being such... This is more Gloomhaven. This is more Gloomhaven ultimately so far. I'm sure it'll change as I continue to play through it. Where I am right now, I think these boxes have to move off to the side. Where I am right now, Frosthaven is just more Gloomhaven, but that's not a bad thing because I like Gloomhaven. I think Gloomhaven is an excellent experience and Frosthaven is giving me more of that. There are changes to the gameplay. There are small changes to balance. There are small adjustments to things like drawing more cards, to the way, um, you know, the way summons work or to the way invisibility works. There are a bunch of small changes to the game, but some of the core changes are things that I haven't yet encountered yet within the system. Despite starting off, despite playing through it, I'm only a handful of scenarios into it, which means I've seen some of the outpost phase, I've seen some of the potential changes in the, the winter versus summer, but I haven't really heavily engaged in just how different the buildings are and what they add to your experience. So for me, Frosthaven currently is more Gloomhaven, but that's still enough for me to say that this is my number three game of 2022 because I like more Gloomhaven. I love the character depth as you dive into it. I've already played as a few of the characters. The primary one I'm going through right now is the Blink Blade, but I love the experience of diving into and learning a new character within the Frosthaven universe. And this very much gives me that in a way that is incredibly satisfying. And so Frosthaven is my number two pick. Which leads me to my number, I don't even know how we're going to keep this on the table at this point, but which leads me to my number two pick. Frosthaven is my number three pick. I may have said two. My number three pick. My number two pick, though, is one that is been, has been compared to Gloomhaven before. And despite Gloomhaven still winning, 
Ah, sorry, these boxes are too large. We have Oswan is my number two pick of 2022. Now, if you've watched my video of Gloomhaven versus Oswan, then you know that I currently rank Gloomhaven above Oswan. The fact that Oswan is my number two pick of 2022 compared to Frosthaven is not that I prefer it to Frosthaven. I know this is confusing, I know. It's that this is just more Gloomhaven. At the end of the day, as much as I enjoy Frosthaven, it is more Gloomhaven, and until it branches out and diversifies itself, it is less exciting to me than Oswan, despite the fact that I prefer the Gloomhaven and Frosthaven system to Oswan. Hopefully it all makes sense. Uh, part of this is excitement based. My point is, they're close. I don't know whether Oswan eventually overtakes Gloomhaven, but at least as far as my games that I am most excited about for 2022, Oswan does win there. This is a game that very much took me by surprise. Similar to Zombicide Undead or Alive, I had played this once on TTS, and I enjoyed it enough that I was like, I'll give it a few more plays, but I don't imagine it stays. And like Zombicide Undead or Alive, the more I played Osworn, the more I went from, I, I think I like it, but I don't imagine it stays in my collection, to the more, more I went to, this game is absolutely staying around. Four giant boxes of way too much stuff over the top, and all, it is sticking around, because it is so good at what it does. The story, the branching pathways it gives you, the, the narrative it gives, and as far as you go through the experience, the choose your own adventure elements as you go through experience, and then, of course, the media's part, the actual encounters themselves, the boss battles you fight, each one being vastly different in terms of how they play out and what they do and what they bring to the table. Oswan is a game that does a lot of things incredibly well. There are elements of Frosthaven and Gloomhaven that I like more, and elements that I still can't pick Oswan over them just yet, but I am curious to see what happens across 10 more plays of Oswan and what happens and where the game ends up for me. But regardless of where it ends up in comparison to Gloomhaven, I can tell you that this is one of my favorite games of all time currently, just from what it brings to the table. It is very good at what it does. You do have to be willing to sign up for a campaign game. It does give you the one-shot potential, but I don't believe, based on, I haven't played one-shots, but from what what it does in terms of the way it handles them, I think you will be losing out tremendously on the experience if you're engaging only one shots. I think it will shine as a campaign game, but that means you do have to be willing to give it the time to actually shine as a campaign game. And then my number one game of 2022, and if you've been watching my top 100 games of all time, with the, together with Devin and Meg, going through the top 100 games of all time, if you've been watching that, my number one game of 2022 was not on that list because I put together that list before this game arrived, and so it should have been on the list. But in case you're wondering why it's not, that's going to be Encyclopedia from Holy Grail Games. This is my number one game of 2022. Yes, above Frosthaven. Yes, above Gloomhaven and Oswan and all those things. Above Endless Winter and The Veer and, and the Foundations of Realm above all those, I love Encyclopedia. I mentioned about Mythic Mischief. The Mythic Mischief was one of a handful of games that have stayed on my shelf and I treated as active games with my collection. Well, that's true of the prototype I had for Encyclopedia as well. That game sat on my shelf. It got played. It got played again and again and again. I introduced it to my game group. They have mostly loved it and have asked for it to be played again. And I'm excited to finally have this copy along with the premium components, along with the expansions. Encyclopedia to me is a medium weight Euro puzzle that is amazing. It is absolutely amazing what it does. It gives you cascading benefits in terms of everything you do. One of the reasons I love this game so much is whenever you do something in the game, you often get multiple rewards or perks for that. You might have been trying to get that species card, but you'll also move your star up the track, which will trigger a few more bonuses, which will give you your hands on an expert, an expert that will reward you for your next planned action when you go research that species. The game is all about trying to gather species, research those species, and then submit your findings, all to get as many victory points as possible, but the game heavily rewards you for specializing while giving you exports that will diversify as far as what they'll do and how they'll add to your puzzle. And so you're constantly seeking out the combination of point elements that most interweave properly to give you a meaty rewarding engine. To me, this is one of my favorite medium euros in my collection at this point. Uh, for sure in 2022, it is my number one game, not even a question. And I'm curious as far as how it holds up. I'm curious, if you, if you watch my top games of 2023 next year, my top 100, I don't know where this is, but I can tell you right now, it is very high up. I've played this a whole lot, including from covering it for the campaign, including playing it after the campaign. I have played it solo. I have not dived into any of the expansions yet because it only just arrived. This is Encyclopedia from Holy Grail Games, my number one game of 2022. And that's everything. That's been the top 10 games of 2022 as far as the ones I've played. I've gone through the ones I want to include. I'll have a variety of other lists, including including there's a whole list of games we haven't gotten to that we want to play, the games we missed out on that we're hoping will in some way hold up for us of 2022. There's going to be the top 10 disappointments of 2022. Some of these videos may have gone up. I don't know the order of these things. And again, like I said already, over on Patreon, there'll be again more videos of different games if you want to check out any of those. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, I hope you have a good one.